the French American Heritage Foundation. I would like to welcome everyone here this evening. And what we want you to do is have a good time. We want everybody to share all their French Canadian and their French uh, experiences and their love for the language and love for the culture. Okay, we have a special uh, speaker here tonight with us, special guest who came from out east, out where they call people like us, they call them Franco-Americans, here we call them French Canadians. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And we have for our speaker this lovely lady here. She received her BA in French from Middlebury College and her master's and PhD in French studies from Brown University. She's very interested in the Twin Cities and our French Canadian culture and she brings with her the culture of the people who came down from Quebec in, into New England. And that's a total different story, a story that we expressed or that we experienced here in the Midwest. Our story is totally different. We had the voyagers, we had those people coming through Canada and northern Minnesota, and they came down here and they named all the lakes and the prairies and the reefs, and then the people from New England, not necessarily French Canadians, came down through the Chicago area in the 1850s, brought with them their money started the mills, and hired the French Canadians to work for them. So, with no more further ado, I'm going to present to you Eileen Angelini. Oh. Thank you so much. I'm going to take the microphone out of here because I don't like standing behind a podium. I'm a wanderer. And that might be because of my family background, which I'll explain to you before we get started with parts of the presentation. Yes, I am Franco-American on my mother's side. As you can tell by my last name, Angelini, that's my father's side. I did not change my name when I got married because my husband's last name was O'Malley. <laughs> I look like I'm O'Malley. That's the funny reason, but also my last name means little angels in Italian. It's, very, it's part of who I am. Um, with both sides of my heritage, and I couldn't let go of that. I, I love my last name as well as my first name. Now, I am Franco-American on my mother's side. Her father was Richard Kerrigan, so you're thinking that's Irish. Where's the Franco-American side? It's with her mother, who was Acadian-French and Potawatomi, which is a sub-tribe of these Iroquois. Okay? So, I'm a good Métis. <laughs> that's heritage. I grew up in New England. I grew up in Lemister, Massachusetts, which is where plastic was invented. Foster Grant, Tupperware, Rubbermaid, all that good stuff. And why, and that explains why there were so many French speakers coming down from Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Remember, I said my mom is Acadian, not Quebecois. All right. So any questions yet? You are allowed to interrupt me and ask questions, whatever you want. Um, so I was very blessed in 2010. I was awarded a Fulbright Award to the University of McMaster to explore the Francophone populations of North America. So not just in Canada and not just in Louisiana, but also in New England. And in my work on the Francophone population of North America, I started, I, just before that, I had worked with Ben Levine, who did the film Reve. And I was sent a copy of, of the rough cut of the film, and I said, hey, Eileen, what do you think? And I said, well, if teachers are going to use this, they need a teacher's guide. Honestly and truly, there's some things that I'm not going to even cover tonight. I'm only going to take two excerpts of the film to discuss with you and tell you about my work with Ben. And that's how Ben and I started working together. All right? So, I do have to ask you know that when a film comes on, we can't film the film, you can film me. So the first part I'm going to talk about with you is the KKK in New England. How many of you knew that there was the KKK in New England? Okay, all right. When you think of the KKK, what comes to mind? Anti-Catholic. Okay, anti-Catholic. You were ready for that one. Okay. All right, but, but okay, okay, but let's think, let's think when you have your average high school student learning about the KKK in U.S. history class, what are they going to learn about? The South. The South. The South. Alabama. 
they're going to learn about mm -hmm. the KKK against African Americans. Yes. Are they going to learn about the KKK activities at night or, or in the daytime as well? Night. 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 At night. night. Are they going to learn about the KKK lifting up their masks? No. 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 Are they going to learn about the KKK having a women's auxiliary group? No. What? <laughs> Are they going to learn about the KKK having a boys' scout troop? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Are you, are you going to learn about the KKK in the 1920s being in New England, white on white, and the largest group of the KKK larger than any group in the South? Wow. wow. Oh. Okay? You're not. Now, I'm gonna, as I said, I'm going to show you one part of the film, and then we're going to discuss it. And then I'm going to give you an anecdote from when I did this presentation in Houston, Texas. Let me preface it by saying that when I was invited to go to uh, be the keynote speaker in Houston as part of the Mois de la Francophonie, my husband said, do you really want to be doing your KKK presentation with South? I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> All right? So, but I, it has a very positive story. When I'm showing you this first part, I want you to pay very careful attention to language laws and the New York Times. Okay? Any questions before I get started? All right, let's go, Mark. He's my assistant here. I, so I will tell, I will out myself right now and tell you that I'm a professor of French. Okay. And what I think is really interesting about this is that as a professor of French, I don't think about the distinction between Catholics and Protestants as meaning anything to the French language after the seven, after the eighteen, after the late 1700s. And you're teaching me something that I have to remember to correct my students, to correct what I told my students. It's a huge uh, growing up in New England. There is definitely a, I don't want to say division, but there's a sharp distinction between Protestant and Catholics. And as um, one of the speakers said, if you're French speaking, you're Catholic. If you're English speaking, you're Protestant. It's very, it's a very, very sharp division. Yes. I, I was first, when I raised my hand, I was thinking that in North Dakota, 1927, there was a huge resurgence of the KKK against Catholics. But then as I was sitting here, I was thinking of something else that might have been a factor as well. There was a certain problem with Huguenots and mm -hmm. between French Catholics and mm -hmm. Protestants. And the Huguenot population basically came to the U.S. In the Carolinas, and, yes. And uh, that might have contributed somewhat to the no, no, I don't know. No, 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 no. There's a, there's a deeper reason why. There's okay. a much deeper reason why. It has nothing to do with what happened with the Huguenots. It has nothing to do with like the Protestant Re Reformation and what was happening in France. In short, you have um, all these mills and factories, and especially the textile mills, and you have the plastic factories in Lovester where I grew up. Okay? They, you have the Protestant owners of these factories and textile mills that are looking for the cheapest labor possible, okay? So you're having floods of different immigrants coming into the U.S. to work in those factories. You have to remember the Beauce region of Quebec, those people were desperately poor. You didn't have a closed border. They went down into New England to work in the factories during the week. They were not intending to stay, and they would go back on the weekends, bring their pay home with them in attempts to save the family farms, okay? All right, there were even coyotes, meaning those Yankee um, uh, recruiters that would go up into these poor farming regions to get these young men to, hey, come make a couple dollars per week to come down to the factories. And the reason they were going up to those regions is they knew they could get them to work for dirt cheap. So you had the Irish Catholics and the Italian Catholics turning against the French Catholics because they were crossing the picket lines when the others were, were, were picketing to get a higher wage or better working conditions. So the French Canadians were really the lowest person on the totem pole. Okay? 
So it's set up not only were the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants aimed, you know, tense against them. It's like, okay, we're going to use this as cheap labor. They're not going to stay. They're going to go back and forth. Okay? But you have the other Catholics angry at them. Then you got the stock market crash. And the borders closed. And they can't go back home. Because if they go back home, they can't get back in. So they're sending their money home, but they still have to stay on the U.S. side. And they created their French neighborhoods, and they weren't assimilating. That's what caused the tension. Minnesota had 130,000 KKK in 1926. Mm -hmm. So we weren't so far behind, really. And interestingly enough, because I grew up in the Scandinavian area, it was the Scandinavians who were leading the KKK in Minnesota at that time, including our governor. The other well, it's similar to what was happening just to the north of you in San Bonifaz, in Winnipeg, and Manitoba. And, and about the same time, because the, the federal government up in Canada was looking the other way when the Orange and the KKK were up in Manitoba doing their lovely actions. And the reason why they were looking the other way was they didn't want another province like Quebec. The, one of the things that your talk is so far very interesting and combinations, but all the Canadians like 1755, like my relatives, they mixed in actually and intermarried after about a 10 year period. Even some served in the American Revolutionary Army. But I think you're quite right, dependent on industrialism. But at the end of the 19th century, racial purity was very profound and hostility towards foreigners was very profound. Yes. And World War I exaggerated against all foreigners with Germans taking the, in Minnesota, the thrust of it. So there was like a cauldron, but I can see specifically why you said the French as the re most recent and threatening immigrants got the whole focus of that blast furnace of all these hates that actually go with democracy. Right, and I'll give you another example. I was, uh, it's actually two examples I'm going to give in addition to keep what happened in Houston, Texas. But I was invited to give this presentation of Western Historical Society of Western Massachusetts after doing it in my hometown. So I'll have to back up to explain about the hometown presentation. And I did this first part, and there was an elderly gentleman that raised his hand who explained to me, and gave me the reference for this, and furthered my research, that when his mother, who was born in Worcester and worked in the Worcester City Hall, married his father, who was French-Canadian, she lost her U.S. citizenship. Wow. It was because it was before women had the right to vote, and so his mother became stateless. She was no longer a U.S. citizen, and she was not a Canadian citizen. And after she came back from her honeymoon, she lost her job at the Worcester City Hall, her public service job. And when women got the right to vote in 1920, this, they could no longer do this. And the only time that this law was reenacted was during World War II, that the American woman married a Japanese citizen. She would lose her U.S. citizenship. If, did you look at all at the 1924 Immigration Act, where Italians, Northern Italians, and Southern Italians were split into two groups? Southern Italians were called a different race, and they were cut down to the smallest percentage of being able to get into the United States simply because they were a different race. No, I didn't know that, but I know up until mm, at least 1950, if not 1960, Italians were, when you filled out your census, they were a separate race. Yeah, well, I mean... In the, and when my mother married my father, we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to point out, against the 20s, Sacco Vanzetti, I mean, if, I think if we collected all the kinds of racism and anti foreignism that went with American democracy, thriving, booming democracy, it's not very nice. It's not very nice to Slavs either or yeah. Poles. No, it's not. No. It's, it's, it's the most recent person, the lowest person on the totem pole. It really is. Well, 
Let me back up I'm and tell sorry. you about, no, no, no. Let me tell you about when I did this for my hometown, okay? Um, this was July 6, 2011. You're probably wondering, why does she remember that exact date? <laughs> well, it's very easy to remember that exact date because I was at the World Youth Peace Summit at uh, Hart in Hartford, Connecticut, at the University of Hartford. And I was in the area and I figured I'd go, go visit my parents. And so my mother let my hometown library, who saw me grow up, know that I was coming home. So he contacted me and said, well, if you're going to be in the area, do you want to do a presentation on the film that you're working on with Ben Levine? I'm like, sure, I'll be in the area. Why not? I'll be safe. So I got to my parents around July 4th, and I stopped in the library on the 5th to connect with the library. He says, you know, you might not get it many people tomorrow because this is July 4th holiday. I'm like, I get it. No worries. He says, but then again, it's supposed to be blistering hot tomorrow. We're air conditioned, so we might get a few extra people. I'm like, okay, I can go with the flow. I'm flexible. All right, so the presentation's at 7 o'clock. My parents and I would get there early. And we started, and my mother said, listen, listen, there's people behind us speaking French because there's still a very strong French speaking population in my hometown. Okay? Well, at about 125 people, they had to say no more can come in because we had a yeah. standing room only. And I'm thinking, okay, this is this is interesting. And I do the first part, and the priest from St. Cecilia's Church, the French Catholic Church in my hometown, raises his hand. He says, you realize that the KKK burned our school building in 1925? Oh, my God. Thank you. No. Now, remember... Remember when, in the movie, she said, you know, if you asked about it, people would, mm -hmm. I'm like, no. He says, come by the parish tomorrow, I'll hook you up. <laughs> like, okay, all right, I'll come by. If you didn't know, this helps me. But, in short, the KKK had targeted five French Catholic parishes in my area. St. Cecilia's was the third one. And I went through all the microfiche of the newspapers from when this happened. And very interestingly enough, the, it was deemed an accident. Although, very funny that it was deemed an accident because the detectives found out that this elementary school girl was approached by two gentlemen wanting to know when school ended. Now, if that was my daughter walking home from school and two strange men went up to her, don't you think I'd go to the police right away? Absolutely, but this is 1925, okay? And the, the nun that was responsible for locking up the school, okay, received a call from a neighbor saying, there's, a, there's, there's fire in the school. The firemen, when they went to the school building, the door wasn't locked, okay? But it was deemed an accident. <laughs> Okay, the next church that was targeted was in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, which is next, the, the Twin City. Fitchburg and Lemster are the Twin Cities of Massachusetts. And they, was, they had targeted St. Bernard's Church. And what did the parishioners do, because they had learned from St. Cecilia's, they did a human shield around the school building, and the KKK backed off. Okay. Um, there were very active um, cross burnings in my hometown. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, how come I never learned about this? Because during the bicentennial, not only did you learn about the American Revolution, you had to learn about your state history. And we also spent quite a bit of time in the Lemster Historical Society. We had to learn about the history of Johnny Appleseed coming from Lemster and the plastic factories. But we never learned about the KKK. Very interesting. And I really had to dig through that microfiche to find the information about what, how it was deemed an accident. Okay, so then I got invited to Worcester, and then I met the gentleman who told me about his mother. Now I'm in Houston, Texas. Okay? I show this first part. Now, I should also warn you that when I came up to the school, I was invited by uh, the French consulate in Houston, Pablo Juan de la Focofani. And I get there and I'm like looking at the presentation posters. And then and the person pulled me and said, Yeah, we changed the title of your presentation because we don't want any riots. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Like, oh, okay, sure. okay. <laughs> what did I get myself into? <laughs> okay. It's like, all right, no, I can do this. Put on your big girl shoes, go in there, you got this, right? I get in there, I, should, I do the same introduction or slightly different. I show the first part, 
You could have heard a pin drop. So I said, any questions? And finally, one woman raises her hand and she says, why do we in the South have to take all the responsibility for the KKK? Mm -hmm. It was one of the most fascinating discussions I've had with any group because I said, why is it in the US history textbooks that students don't learn about the KKK in any other area of the US but in the South? Why? Is it because it's an easier narrative for the students to learn? I don't know. I don't have an answer for it. I really don't. But let me ask you this. Who knows in which state the KKK originated? Alabama. No, it was not Alabama. It's like Ohio or something. You're close. Indiana. 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 And Indiana still has a it still has a very, very strong KKK presence. And what's even worse is Indiana was upset during the Civil War that it had to be a northern state. So there's there's a lot of issues with Indiana. <laughs> well, let's just say, hmm, okay, we won't talk politics. <laughs> but let me say this much too. When I did this presentation shortly thereafter in Connecticut, there was a history teacher who said to me, you realize the KKK is back up on the rise in Connecticut? No. And he showed me a flyer that had been put underneath his windshield when he had gone grocery shopping recently. Oh. That's scary. And I said, I thought we were better than that. But obviously, there's still a lot of anger. We're living in very angry times, and I'm hoping we can be less angry, but education, I think, is the key to reducing the anger. What year was that? The with flyer under the windshield wiper. 2012. Because oh, wow. it was March 2012, because I did that after doing Lumster, which was 2011, so it was March 2012. Well, in, in out in western Minnesota, along the border, we our history center, thanks to a set of combinations, got documents from some person who was just collecting KKK information. And they'd been unused. The person wanted me to do them. I just didn't have the time to take them up. But her thesis, the person who collected them up, that the, and I'm asking you a question. I'm just saying this to set up a question. Okay, so you're sending those documents, right? No, I'm not to do that. She said that she thought the agency of spreading it in southern Minnesota. I'm not saying I agree with this, but the agency was actually foreman on work crews who were building roads, and they're the ones that helped establish chapters. That was just her theory. She wanted somebody to study it. So my question to you is, we, we I got a good idea where it kind of just like a mold is in the behind the baseboard. But what were the act? What do you take to be the active agents that conducted these prejudices in the specifically targets money? Guam, <laughs> much? Absolutely, absolutely, money and power being top of the heap. Um, I the KKK was also uh, quite prominent in the Buffalo area, and I'm currently living in Buffalo, New York. And I did a little bit of background to find out what their presence had been. And there was an Irish Catholic, I believe it was Irish Catholic, mayor, uh, candidate for mayor against a Protestant candidate for mayor. And remember in this clip that you saw, the KKK was promoted as being a political force. And that's why they started to lose a lot of their members. Because they didn't realize, wait a minute, this is not a political party. This is more... You know, initially it was like, okay, keep the United States for Americans and keep out the foreigners, and then it became it became known as a hate group. So there was this KKK candidate and the Irish Catholic candidate in Buffalo. There was actually involved the police um, lieutenant, and he was uh, in. There was a there was a shooting. There was people that get killed, but it turned out that the Catholic won the race to be mayor. So it caused a lot of tension in Buffalo itself. And then shortly after that, the, well, I should say shortly after that, but it wasn't long after that 
that the KKK disbanded in Buffalo. So is that why we're white now? Because that same power group wants us to share the blame with them for what they did in the past? I, I, just a question. I, I can't answer. I, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> He's, a, he's he's playing devil's advocate, and, I, I, and, I'm, and I'm part of me going like this because I'm mixed. I, I say I'm mixed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't, I'm the beginning, wasn't the beginning of the downfall of KKK an uh, issue of sexual abuse of uh, uh, one really? of the leaders? Right. Yes, yeah. really. Like using a, a child or something. Quite possibly. I think I've heard something like that too. The leader of the, the KKK <laughs> in Indiana at the time, I believe it was Indianapolis. All of a sudden, they found out that he had been molesting children and he had been doing all these things that the KKK said, uh, you know, were wrong. And, and the KKK had all these good ways of making American families wonderful and happy. And all of a sudden, they found out that he was doing all these things that they were preaching against. But in New and that England, brought it down. Okay, but also in New England, in my area. You started to have people resisting KK actions in, in, in mass, and not just the French Catholics. Wasn't one of the great leaders, Margaret Chase Smith from Maine, who stood up to McCarthy? And wasn't she one of the great? She's French Canadian. You know that? Yeah, Mar Margaret Chase Smith. She's okay. my relative. I, I'm related to her. Okay. She stood that up to the. Know. She stood up to the McCarthyism. To the, right. She's from Maine. That I, I don't know about her. So that I, that I learned more Bernie, about her. She's in the news today. Mm -hmm. okay. Because she stood up to the she stood up to the to the wrongness of Congress and, and somebody was I, I just read about her. Okay. Was, she was a brave person from Congress who stood up. I was gonna ask you, because you've given us a totally different portrait of the KKK, but go, going back to the, the French in New England. And this resistance that you're talking about, how much solidarity was there among? Because it turns out the KKK had a lot of uh, victims, as it were. And how a lot of victims? Yeah. Well, let's just say that growing up, there was still a French newspaper in my hometown. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you, and there was, so in Lemster, there was French Hill, in Fitchburg, there was Claiborne. So, very distinct areas. But then also, you had coming in after them, you had the Puerto Rican population coming in, working in the factories as well, which I'm going to, this is going to segue into my next section because you're going to, the next section is going to show in the state of Maine where they're talking about how come they've never elected a French governor or member of Congress at the national level when, when, it's, when more than two thirds of the population of the state is French Canadian, Franco American. That changed in 2012, January 2012. And the reason I know this is because of my Connecticut presentation. You notice I kind of like key in <laughs> certain dates about my presentations. It helps me remember things. What's important is that there was a French Franco-American governor of Massage of Maine elected in 2012, and he ran on the platform of keeping, you know, being Franco-American. Franco-American make the governor for a Franco-American state. Um, I believe so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Unfortunately, in the, in the month of March, and this was literally like a week before my presentation, he was putting in implementations to keep the Puerto Ricans and other Mexicans from the United States to get jobs. Once again, low person on the totem pole. So. Yes, but he's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Margaret J. Smith was half from me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's show the second clip. We're going to have to back up in the clip. Hold on. We're going to back up. We'll watch a little bit more. And I want you to pay very careful attention. I'm going to ask you this question because the question was about what was happening into the schools. That's the next part I want to show you. Because children were discriminated against. Let me ask you this. Why, oh, before we show this part, why did Franco-American children have the dirtiest underpants?
digesting that one? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah, one thing I noticed the power of language has on someone, how emotionally attached someone can be to the variety and having that variety validated. Um, this summer I was able to visit Franc Francophone, Maine, and I went to Lewiston, I went all the way up to Fort Kent and Madawaska areas. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, maybe if you visited those two areas, if you feel a different feeling of attachment, because they're two different, like, very different groups. So Acadian ancestry and ancestry more further up north versus the Cape, the, the mill speakers. And because when I spoke with people, they seemed more emotionally involved with the language in the Lewiston area. And I feel, is this where most of the footage is more from the southern part versus in the St. John River Valley? Yes, yes. Did and then you, also to, yeah. remember I grew up in Massachusetts, so there was the enclave yes. of the French where I grew up. Um, I'll give you a personal example, okay? Because my middle school and high school French teachers were Francos. And you have to be very careful because um, the difference between being Franco versus Franco-American, do you know the distinction of that? A Franco is a Franco-American who grew up speaking French in the household. A Franco-American is someone that is of French-American French -American descent but didn't necessarily speak French growing up. So if you get someone, that they'll ask you, was that Franco? They mean, did you, are you French, Frank, Franco-American growing up speaking French in the household and learning English in school? Okay, that's a very important distinction. And if you say, for example, no, no, I'm Franco-American, but I grew up speaking English, and I didn't really learn it at home, I learned it at school, then they, there's a little, oh, you'll get that kind of look. Okay. Um, I grew up in a trilingual household because my dad's family spoke Italian, and my mother's family spoke French. And I also learned Spanish in school. Okay? So, am I Franco? Yes, but I'm not only Franco because of the other languages in there. Um, and as I said, my middle school and my high school French teachers were Franco. So I get to college and I went to Middlebury College as an undergrad. And I decided to pursue my, my master's and PhD at Brown. So after my first couple weeks at Brown, I'm meeting with my advisor. You have to select who you want to work with. And my advisor, who I'm still very close with to this day, I'll never forget this. She says, you know, Eileen, you're not going to want to use your letter of recommendation from so-and-so at Middlebury. And I'm not going to say the name. And just, this was a professor I absolutely adored at Middlebury. And I'm like, and she said, quote, I, I and she, my advisor was very careful. She'll tell you essential things, but she won't divulge your confidence or let you read the letter, okay? Because she won't cross that line. But she said, you should know that she thought you were the best student she ever had on paper, but that you need to lose your Franco-American accent. Oh, no. Oh. 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 Okay? So is Franco. Okay, and this professor was was American but of French descent from France and had French parents. So I'm like, okay, that's good to know. Then, as I'm finishing up my PhD, I go to France to be a lecturer for a year in Lyon. And I got it from the other side of the pond. <laughs> And let's just say it wasn't about my French, it was about my English. <laughs> I go into a department meeting, and you have me from Brown, you had another candidate from Penn State, who actually went to Middlebury with me, which was kind of cool that we circled around and found each other in the south of France. And then you had two girls from England. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So I was teaching a phonetics class because I was the only one that had a phonetics background. And the department chair comes in with this dictionary. He was, he had, you know, one of those real proper things because, of course, he had learned his English in Great Britain, in the UK. And he said, and he hands me this dictionary and he says, you need to use this so when you, you're transcribing the words on the board, I'm like, why? He says, well, you speak American. <laughs> no, I speak American English. There's no such thing as American. That's not a language. I speak American English. 
I don't speak British English. So we got into this little bit of a debate, and I said, look, I don't say schedule. I say schedule. <laughs> and I'm going to transcribe it into phonetically on the board as schedule, not schedule. <laughs> because if I do that, the students aren't going to learn it properly. <laughs> he backed off. <laughs> but for the rest of the year, he kept saying, I spoke American. I'm like, no, I speak English. English is my native language, not American. I'm an American citizen. Okay? So, as I said, I got from both sides of the pond. On, on the U.S. side, I have a Franco accent. On the, on the other side of the pond, I've got the American accent. So here's where I had my sweet justice and sweet rewards. At the end of the year, you're thinking, okay, he's going to pick the two English girls to, be, to stay a second year. Guess who he picked and he wanted to come back for a second year. He said, sorry, I got a job in the U.S. Nice to have you. <laughs> so, but actually, no, I, I, my mother was always afraid that if I stayed in France too long, I'd get married and stay over there. And I was like, no. And I really was homesick after about a year and a half. I wanted to get home back to my family. So, I love my country. We're not perfect, but I'm still, I love my country. All right, so did that answer your question? The, the first part, yeah, and then the second part was, did you feel like the difference, like certain regions, feel like your hometown, you connected similar to like the Lewiston experience? What about the people further north? I actually interviewed for a position at Fort Kent. Fort Kent, so, <laughs> well, so, yeah, so the interaction there, did you feel like a different, like, it's such a large state, but it's small in terms it's, of oh, French definitely, speakers. And you know that recently Maine was considering splitting in half, staying part of the U.S., but having northern Maine and southern Maine because of this division? Yes, it's very real. It, it, but did you feel like their identity with the, at, towards French was a little, any different than, than maybe what we're seeing in the documentary, where it was like very, I feel like, very attached to the language? I actually, there is another section of the documentary which comes from northern Maine. Okay. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I was interviewing for a dean's position, and I will say this much. My husband's in the medical field, so it's easier for him to follow me than for me to follow him. And he was looking at the website, and he's like, you, you can't take this job. And I'm like, why? He says, look at the Chamber of Commerce. It's all in French. I'm only going to be able to find a job working in the back corner whittling wood because I can't speak French. So yes, it's a much, I, 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 I would say this, it's a much stronger element in the north of Maine than in the south of Maine. It's much more anchored, and French is first. Whereas in the South of Maine, English is going to come first, and like, yes, I'm a Frank, I'm a Franco, and they'll switch to French. Whereas in Northern Maine, they're going to speak French to you first. And that's I guess because I'm both ways, does that make sense? Right, and that's kind of what my experience was. Right. Okay. Okay. Nothing from this table. I'm looking over there. Well, I'm just curious because. We're all immigrants, and you know, it took three to four generations for my Swedes to give up their Swedish papers and stop speaking Swedish until they were five when they went to school. And where I grew up, there was Italian, Slovenian, and Finnish, and they gave it up for the third generation. Like, what is it about a culture that what makes them want to hang on to the culture? Whereas many no, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I'm in awe. I'm well, I think for the Franco-Americans, they never intended to stay. Oh. They were going back and forth. They were going back and forth, so they weren't intending to stay. And you also have that history of resistance to anything English because of the La Conquête. Yes. And it's very interesting because uh, I'm not going to remember the name of this bishop, but when there were so many <coughs> French Canadians flooding into New England, he was having an influence on the, Catholic, the French American Catholic churches of New England and keeping that where you saw the young man saying, obey, obey, yeah. obey. You know, the individual doesn't, is not, doesn't come first. It's like the group, you gotta take care of the group. So, yes. Do you think there's any connection um, in the, to, the, to, your, to her question between the fact that French itself, even in other Francophone countries or France or other places, is incredibly important? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's so deeply a part of, of French, of, you know, for example, in France. You know, people will have arguments about grammar, yeah. and right. it's not a—it's yes. not a—it's not a thing for teachers. It's—it's it's 
There's columns in the newspapers where people are like... Well, l'Académie Française, that you have like an official part of government that is just on regulating the French language. So, yes. I'm just wondering how much is that a part of Francophone world culture where your love of like, you know, my Italian friends can't speak a word of Italian, but do not mess with risotto. Like, do not mess with risotto. I just wonder if like, I wonder... No, you don't mess with the Italian. Sauce, oh, it's it's like it's like the sauce. I can't even say the word. I know. I really respect. I'm yes. sacred. But I wonder if, if also for for a French speakers all over the world, French the language has a more important part to them for them than other. Do you, do you think that's possible? It might be because where French has lost so much world dominance that they're trying to hang on to it to make sure it doesn't get lost. And also you have to look at the fact now there's, a, there's somewhat of a resurgence in the sense that with Francophone Africa and the populations in France is having to deal with the fact that there's more native speakers of French born outside of France than there are in France. Mm -hmm. So they're struggling with, do we embrace this because then the French language is going to become strong again around the world? Or is that our same French? So there's a little bit of that struggle. Well, France, or Paris, Paris, has been very imperial with its language. Like Rabelais had a tremendously rich language in the 16th century the language that Acadia had, whereas mm -mm. The, <laughs> yes, yes, the Acadians as folk storytellers and proverb tellers had a very, very rich French, much richer okay, but it's not than even. Quebecois that had <laughs> somewhat of diminished French. However, Paris, if you go to 1800 in Paris, how many people in France do you think, what percentage do you think spoke Parisian French? Okay, hold on, hold on, I need to interrupt you. I need to interrupt you. Okay, because you got to go back to Les Figuois. Les Figuois. You have to go back to the King's Dwarf Daughters. Yes. Because what happened was, France, when it was sending over men, they weren't intending to colonize. They were explorers. Remember, Samuel de Champlain was trying to find the fastest route to China. Okay? It wasn't to establish colonies. And Louis XIV, he just wanted that ermine for his lovely rose. Okay? So if you look at the map that was at the beginning, the French had much more land than the British but the British had more population. And why? Because they were sending men over. The British were sending over families, men and women. What do you think happens when you just send men? <laughs> you, missed, you missed my point. No, 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 wait, I'm you getting there. Wait, wait another please. Another you misinterpreted please. what I meant by colonize. No, please. I just, said just, colonize, I, just... I meant of southern France. But I didn't I... mean colonize North America. I meant Paris colonized France. Not colonize North America. Could I please finish? Yeah, you can, but <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I don't want to be wait. answered by a false premise. Oh, oh, oh. You're not letting me get to I my know answer. That. I know that. Okay, Sorry. and I'm trying to set it up so that way I'm covering all my bases. So please let me finish. No, yeah, I'm all through. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's a professor too, so. I understand, I understand, but I wouldn't interrupt someone as much as he's interrupted me, so I appreciate letting me, just let me finish, please. I'm through, I told you. Okay. All right, so, Louis XIV sends over the king's daughters. Now, who are these king's daughters? They're the orphans. You have to remember, France at the time, there were multiple languages in France, but these girls were from Paris region, mostly well, fairly well educated because they were in the orphanages. So they were bringing over the king's language as well. So when, if you look at historically how the French language has developed, the French of North America is more true to the origins of Old French than what was happening in France because the language in France was being influenced by 
the Breton language, the Norman language, and the other languages that were happening within France itself. Okay, so when the people in France say to me, well, you speak French, I'm like, well, my French accent is closer to. Okay, so that's, that's a factor as well. Okay? All right. Any questions from the other side of the room? You're, you're interested, but you're waiting again. <laughs> I can't say what I want to say. What do you want to say? <laughs> uh oh. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, I've heard also from this, this group that, and maybe historically, I just have my dates mixed up, that English speakers in what is now New England got pushed up into Canada, like during the French Indian War or something. The Loyalists. Yeah, and I'm asking because I always thought I was French Canadian, but my DNA tells me that I'm more British. Did but you do one of those, those, uh, what yeah. one of those, yeah. what's it the called? Spit test. Yeah. The spit test with, what is it, Ancestry.com? Yeah, yeah. Okay. but my grandmother was French speaking, and we can trace her roots into Canada. So I'm wondering, was there a big push into, a British into Canada, and then you're talking about the Francos coming down, is that a different time period? Well, the Francos were coming down during the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I always, when I'm working on this time period with my students, I always point out that we owe a lot to the French speakers of North America for helping the American independence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the French were fighting with the Huron Indians, and the British had the help of the Iroquois. The Iroquois were the bad boys of the North, okay? And the Iroquois, when they didn't get their debts paid to them by the British after the La, La Conquête, the conquest, helped the American colonists, the revolutionaries, to defeat the British for the American Revolution. So yet, yeah, you did have loyalists that suddenly that were moving from the independent colonies up into Canada. Okay, so that was further back. Yes. Okay, so, and I heard a little bit of something about the spit test. What is, what were you, do you have It's just that every time, every person I've, I've had doing the spit test, uh -huh. they're wondering about its, uh, its uh, accuracy uh, because yeah. of, of different things that have happened. It could very well have been that your ancestors would have been a loyalist that were British, but then moved up and then became French speakers yeah. through the years, depending on where they landed up there. Okay. Hi, Maggie. Huh? Heartbreaking. Very heartbreaking. Because it's a clear case of the, the niece learning French in school out of the book mm -hmm. versus the French that the aunt right. heard. Yeah. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, when someone asks you, how many of you are French speakers here that know French grammar? Okay. So, and John, you're not allowed to answer this because you should know the answer. <laughs> Hands down. Let's see. Okay. All right, so if you're asked a, ne a question and the answer is yes, you respond with? If it's a negative question, how do you respond? Not in, Frank not, in, not in North America. And because it's, either, it's always we. And when I would do it in class, and when I was teaching at Canisius, and I had students from, from Quebec and Ontario, and I'm thinking, okay, yes, back home in New England, my, one of my students would constantly tease me, saying, why are you speaking Spanish in our French class? <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the linguistic differences, along with, with déjeuner, dîner et souper, which you say in North America, and in France you say petit déjeuner, déjeuner, dîner. Okay? So you'd say, like, madame, madame, no, c'est le cours de français, c'est pas l'espagnol ici. Okay. All right, so we'll show one more section. Mm -hmm. No, with sockets in Rhode Island. 
Well, I had this when I was in uh, Lewiston. I was visiting the Bates Mill where they make the bedspreads. And as I was leaving, there was the Franco American Heritage Center coming with their African French speaking group to tour the mills. So that's just over the. So it's okay. exactly that experience. Well, I think it's, and also Woodstock, it has the um, Industrial Museum where it shows about the contributions of the Franco Americans to the industry, all the, all the, Tech, I don't want to say just textile, but all the factories of New England. And it's interesting that Anna's from that region where, she, um, no, Sylvia, sorry, Anna's the one from Senegal, that Sylvia refound her French because she wanted to help Anna. And you heard her speak French. That's French from New England. So that's a Franco accent. So she would be Franco because she grew up hearing French and learned English in school, but she's also Franco-American. Okay. Oreo getting that post dessert. Oh Is everybody starting to fade? Myself included, I admit it. Yes. Just about the documentary. So, um, like Zachary Richard has a documentary, you know, that was in the past, and he has a new one. This one, I was wondering, are you, is there in the works, like having another one come out, kind of like uh, what's going on in French and New England um, several ben, leader, years later? Well, ben, ben is working on a Native American project, okay. and the influences with the Fran Franco-Americans with the Native Americans, so that's his current film. Yeah. So, and that for me is near and dear to my heart right. because of my mother's side with, you know, with my ancestry being Acadien et Potawatamien on my mother's side. Um, but I think that's a really interesting suggestion because especially now that you've got the, the Franco-American governor of Maine who is just, yes, I love your expression, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It does need updating, absolutely, absolutely. But that's a good suggestion. I, making films is costly. Well, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Because Where's the other project at the, with the Franco with the Native American? That's pretty. He's pretty much done that part, and now I'm working on the teacher guide and trying to um, figure out the niche for it because okay. it's it's less French and more Native American. Okay. So, but the film is done. Yes, the film is done. And this one is is out. Yes, this week, this came out in 2008, oh. 2007, because I did the study guide that came out in 2008, and then I redid the study guide and updated the study guide in 2012. Okay. Oops, excuse me. So, yes. Well, thank you so much, and I have to say thank you again to Pierre, because it's Pierre, why I'm here, and his patients were choosing a date of when I could come. <laughs> different things so he wants to say something so. okay I'm going to ask you a question and this is something that's near and dear to a bunch of us in this room to our hearts okay as a French teacher how do we elevate the respect for North American French well that's my big valley wick with my my Fulbright is I always say that by having North American French, it makes French more relevant to our students for wanting to learn it. And once they realize the importance of what happened in the history and the development of our country, it doesn't seem so, I don't want to say useless, but less pertinent, less relevant to them. Yes. Thank you. Can I, can I add to that? Yes, yes. absolutely. So I, I, all right. So I'm, so. My name is Juliette Chevalier, and I am the chair of the Department of French and Italian here at the University of Minnesota. And I wanted to tell you about my colleague, Brian Barnett, whose research, who's right here, I'm pointing at him, he feels uncomfortable, <laughs> whose research is on the French language in the Americas. A little culture. Uh, whose research is on the French language in the Americas. And he is starting to bring the very questions of, about how we should think differently about French today because of this rich heritage into our classroom. So if it ever interests you to know more about what's going on here, 
Um, certainly not the kind of depth of research that you've done yet, but we're working on it. Um, stop by to you because we're we're really actively trying to bring that piece into our classroom and into the kinds of operates that we offer for the community. So. Thank you. Everyone had a good time. Uh, keep looking at our website because we anticipate having a lot more of discussions like this and different programs of interest to everybody. We have a book over here for sale. It's a book that was written by our foundation and it's on the French influence in the state of Minnesota. And there's no other book like it in any library in the world. So it's kind of a very unique book. No, it's a very unique book. There isn't a lot of information on French Canadian influence in the state of Minnesota. There's history books about the state of Minnesota, but not specifically about the French Canadian influence. So we have that book. We also have another book that is the result of a program that we did last year. It's a book called uh, Once There Was a Chapel, or is that what? Yeah. Uh, First There Was a Chapel. Anyway, chapel book. It's very interesting. On, uh, the Cathedral of St. I gotta say one thing. <laughs> Alright, just so we know, one of the, uh, in, in today's newspaper there was an article about Margaret J. Smith. And she was applauded because she stood up to McCarthyism and she had the guts, and she was the first senator in the in the Congress back in 1952. She stood up to McCarthy. <laughs> but I just want everybody to understand, she's my she's my relative. She was half French Canadian. Her, I have her ancestry right here. Oh. Of course, that's very interesting that people don't know that she was French Canadian, but her mother's side were, were French Canadian, and she was a very, very influential senator from the state of Maine. So, you know, in the movie it said we had no, we had nobody who was elected who was uh, from the senator, but actually they did. They just didn't know it. I just wanted to, to highlight out. I want to, I want to thank. You. Dr. Angelini, this is a great evening, and so thank, thank all of you for coming here today. Thank you very much.